my hand upon her knee and she says do you want to see I put my hand upon her breast and she says do you want to kiss gently 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 Johnny gently Johnny my <laughs> Welcome to another edition of Pod from the Crypt. This is Chris Guzzo speaking with Rob Persersher and, of course, Anthony Balzano. I'm going to kick things right into gear. We're going to talk about the two awesome movies. One, The Wicker Man, made in 1973. We're going to mention the 2006 remake with Nicolas Cage. And, of course, we're going to talk about his competition, Midsommar, Midsommar, whatever way you want to call it, made by Ari Asta last year. Big horror over almost three hours long. Well, the big question we're going to answer at the end of this podcast is which one is a better movie, The Wicker Man or Mid Summer? All right, I want to kick oh, it shit. off right to Rob, and I want to okay. hear your thoughts on the original 1973 Wicker Man. Now, Rob, before you start speaking, I just want to let the fans know, in case you guys don't know, that this was based loosely off a book called Ritual that was uh, written by David Piner. It was all the screenplay was written by Anthony Schaefer and it was directed by Robin Hardy. So this is the 1973 classic. Kick it off to you, Rob. Okay, so I've seen the movie twice now. The first time I'd seen it, I was probably 11 or 12. So the only thing I remembered was the end. And then on rewatching it, I had kind of remembered not liking the movie that much until the end. And now having rewatched it today, I was completely wrong. This is a fantastic movie. And it has a fantastic musical soundtrack and extremely hot girls in it. It, did. Yeah. it, had, it had that folk music score to it, right? So there was probably music playing about every two to three minutes of the movie. They had a, like a, they laid a soundtrack about like 20 to 25 songs, correct? Yeah, yeah. I've been listening to it all day, actually. I think it's a great soundtrack. It's weird, weird music. It's, it, it's just Definitely. Like unnerving. <laughs> it is. Yeah. It's something you, I could take a shower to that music, but like... <laughs> But, you know, somebody's going to come in and knock on the door and be like, what the fuck are you listening to? But I'm not going to, I'm not, I don't mind. Yeah, you, you know what it reminds me of? I know you hate this movie. Uh, Mandy with Nick Cage. Oh, yeah, the cold that's meter plays episode. music I can't in the wait same, to get like, cold vein. Yeah, I love, I love that, that movie. movie. I love that movie. Right? Isn't it awesome, the chainsaw fight? Oh, yeah, my God. It's just so like Texas Chainsaw 2. Yeah, that was pretty dope. All right, so before we get into anything else, I do want to mention that it does star Edward Woodward as Sergeant Howie. And Sergeant Howie is the cop that comes to Summer's Isle to look and in search of a girl. We also have star Christopher Lee, who plays Lord Summer Isle. Um, right. He actually, just so you guys know, a quick note, he didn't take any kind of profit for this movie. And he's, to this day, well, not, he, he don't live anymore, God rest his soul. But up until he died, he said this was the best role he ever took. He had been, one of the best movies he was ever in. You know that? Yeah. yeah. You know, he, he does some good singing, too, in that movie, with his you extremely so? deep voice. Yeah, and he dances. Remember, he has a pretty dope dance as the uh, the hag, the god hag. With the yeah. long hair, right? And yeah, yeah, he's dancing. I was cracking up today. My friend uh, James was watching it with me. I was cracking up. And at the and same time, the sergeant is dressed as the uh, fool. And he makes fool. him dance. And he's yeah. yelling at him, right? Because he thinks yeah, he's yelling at him to dance. Deeper. Right. You know what's great? He, he knew he was the fool the whole time, right? I don't know. That's a good question. After watching it, I, I it looks like he pretends yeah. like he doesn't know. But, yeah, I think it's one big game, one big setup. So he knew this this entire time. Yeah, it's pretty interesting, especially when you compare it to the remake with Nick Cage. Um, the ritual, the rituals in the older one are just much more interesting. They kind of miss out on that entire ritualistic process in the Nick Cage version. 
Well, if you think about it, the original movie is about like poly polytheism versus monotheism. So like right. the, the Sergeant Howie towards the end of the film, you know, he claims that there's only one God. He actually says it throughout the whole film, but while he's burning yeah. up a lot right before the end that he dies, he's, you know, he's saying God, like, I, I believe in one God and like that killing me is not going to bring your crops so all these gods. So like there is like a big theme of like the many gods versus one God. Uh, I, I think me and you've uh, talked quite a bit and we haven't given Anthony one iota to talk. So I'm going to take him <laughs> off. Yeah, he yeah. looks he, like he's in the red room at some strip club or some hooker <laughs> place down in Europe. <laughs> This is actually a Red Room stream for the Dark Web guys, and we just have Anthony tied up. He's not actually allowed to talk here. I don't know what he's doing. <laughs> what are your thoughts, Ant? On the uh, the original Wicked Man? Of course. Yeah, but on the monotheism versus polytheism and the theme in the, the Nick Cage one, which is matriarchy versus just Nick Cage because he's not misogynistic or anything. It's just matriarchy versus Nick Cage. Well, I think the one with Nicolas Cage is pretty, it's like almost like a parody because it's so ridiculously funny and outrageously stupid. It was just it another really terrible remake. Yeah. yeah. Um, but the original Wicker Man, um, I definitely think, think that uh, it was a great film. It was original. No one's ever seen something like that before. Um, I find that uh, the... It was it had a lot of creepy moments, and I definitely think that it was hold up today because 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 of, of uh, the whole religious thing that it interprets throughout the whole film with like paganism um, is a very deep religion and it is scary. Um, Do you still think they would have a similar impact today now that people aren't as religious? I I still think it will hold up today because. Uh, because paganism still is a big thing in this world. Um, I think it's almost bigger now, especially in like Western countries, than it was at the time of the film, right? Because yeah, remember, like only, to... only like, what, two years prior, uh, Chris and R's, my like favorite movie, The Demons, came out and was banned in Europe. And that was right, a complete yeah. like blow to the uh, sexuality restrictions that christianity brings to its disciples like for me like i'm not into like one religion like i explore a lot of things and like you know like i read about them and you know i try and get as much information as possible and i used to have someone pretty close to me that was pagan and the shit that yeah. was shared with me with well, that you, got, you had a pentagram with uh, like like fire around it in the other room, right? And you had a your, your, <laughs> your own <laughs> sacrifice waiting, yeah. <laughs> um, it's just it's very um, interesting, entertaining, yeah. and scary all at the same time. That religion, but it definitely keeps you interested. There's so much to learn about it. Yeah. Did you guys like the music? I was a I was a huge fan of the music. The yeah, the music original. was great. It yeah. was. Especially that one scene, like Willow's song, when she tries to seduce him from the other room, and he's oh, up against the wall. Oh my she was God. so sexy and vital and inviting, and she looked so real. I was like that on my couch up against the TV. <laughs> I had my mouth up against the TV, and I was trying to get into it, like in like video drum or something, just trying to suck myself into the TV. <laughs> I have two nice facts about that actress. Her name is Britt Eklund, right? So she actually okay. dated Rod Stewart. Uh, so back in the day, Rod Stewart actually tried oh, to block God. the release of this uh, of the film when he learned that his girlfriend was right. food. Also, That's awesome. she, wait, 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 she was yeah. pregnant during the um, all the nude scenes and during the filming of this. So they were only showing from her top the top of her head to her waist. So they were only showing her breasts. And when they had to show a full frontal nudity of her, they had to get yeah. a body double. So she's like, really? yeah, they got a body double for the full frontal nudity. So people, I, I found this out today, people come up to her or were coming up to ask for autographs of these naked pictures, and she always would refuse to sign them because she wasn't proud of them. Oh, right. Because a lot of the naked pictures were, were the body double, right? Correct, yes. Yes, yeah. Well, even from the top up, I mean, she's a gorgeous lady. 
at the time. I mean, is she alive? Oh, yeah, definitely. I don't know. I got to check the facts. I don't know. I mean, I could, I could she, she was beautiful at the time. Back to the topic at hand. I wanted to talk about the actual horror of the Wicker Man. And I want to ask you when you guys are saying, like, um, what really scared you about this movie? And I'll answer the question first, and then I'll kick it back to you guys. What really terrified me about this movie was that they, this protagonist had nobody at all to side with. There was nobody he could, like, sit down, have a beer with, and, like, confide in. So he was always, like, him versus, like, all these people that are weird. And they were weird to the audience. And what really scared me was probably the last 10 minutes of the film. So I like to compare this film to a fried wonton at the Chinese restaurant because the best part of the fried wonton is in the middle and then you have to eat all the fried noodles to get to the wonton. And that's what this movie was. It was like a lot of filler until the end. And the end made everything make sense. And at the end, what scared me the most is that you knew because these people were the way they were and that he had no friends that at no point in hell was this guy not going to burn to death in that wicker man. And that, to me, was extremely frightening. And, and what was so scary is that this guy is, like, praying and begging to God. And before you, it gets him to fire, you hear the screaming of the animals, which is just very shocking. And then it cuts to the scene of yeah. all these villages. They're singing and dancing, and they're happy because they're going to get their apples back. And uh, yeah. <laughs> this, this, this movie had no violence at whatsoever at the end until the end of the movie the only thing of a jump scare of the movie was maybe when he opens up the uh the closet and the girl just falls down and then she like she jokes around and she runs away oh the little girl yeah the little girl she falls yeah, yeah. in the closet but this wasn't yeah. that jump jump scare or any kind of horror like that it, it was to me what scared me was knowing that this guy is going to die right in front of my eyes and I can't do anything about it and nobody's going to do anything about it. Yeah, that's some real, like, old-school storytelling, just, like, impending doom coming, you know. You know the tragedy is going to happen, and then you just watch this hero character just go down. There's, there's this movie, and uh, nobody ever really talks about it, and I made I made you watch it. It's called The Devils. It was made in 1971. Yeah. Oliver oh, I called it by the wrong name before. It's The Devils. It, it, it's a, it's X-rated, and we could get into that in another podcast. I love that movie. I have it, like, right over here. Right. I but grabbed that was, it it's under a stack of crap. That was made two years prior to this movie, and that was a very similar concept where they had – the priest, he, you know, they, they, bur they burned him alive. And the people, like, went against Oh, spoilers, priest. by the way. Oh, sorry. <laughs> yeah, sorry about spoilers. that. Spoilers. Major he spoilers dies. there. He dies at the end of the movie. Sorry. The priest oh, dies yeah, in the devil. <laughs> <laughs> and he burns horrifically. Horrifically. Yeah. There's also a lot of theater and singing in that movie, too. Especially so I, in the very beginning of it. I Not as much singing as The Wicker Man. Right, but The Wicker Man has definitely gotten more notoriety than that movie over the years. I just wonder if it influenced it or yes. if it kind of ripped it off. Well, yeah, I don't know. I don't think it was a ripoff. No, but, I, uh, I don't think so. I think it plays with similar themes, kind of. Right. Um, I mean, The Devils was just a whole condemnation of Christianity at large, whereas The Wicker Man was critical of Christianity, but also critical of like paganism in the same way. It wasn't necessarily pro-paganism because at the end of the movie, they do sacrifice an innocent man who is, at the end of the day, just trying to save a little girl's life. It's not necessarily a nice thing to do. Um, and they planned it. You know? And, like, even in the Nick Cage one, which was way dumber because the plan went on for, like, 10 years or something, which, I, I don't know. What were they trying to do in that? Did they run out of honey? Like, what was the problem? Yeah, same, it was the same premise. It just had Nick Cage yeah. running around in a bath suit. Yeah, I, and for beating some up women. It is like piled up. Did not on make that movie drama. in 2020. It is not I a think, 2020 movie by any stretch. No. Why? It was it 2006? Yeah, I think I think it was 2006. Yeah. What? Why? Why could that not be made? Because in he runs around in a bath suit punching women. Because it didn't do good in 2006. <laughs> sure. I mean, it was garbage, but was, I kind of like it. I kind of like punching around, punching it, people. It was made Stupid, for $40 million, and it only made back 38 the uh, 
the 2006 one. When wow. Wow. But, See, you know, maybe if they paid Nick Cage less money, they would have done better. Or if they just made a decent movie. That movie is so dumb. There's, like, this whole, like, <laughs> giant car crash scene in the beginning, and then his, like, estranged fiance is running around. Oh, and also he has, like, an estranged daughter he didn't know anything about. They just, like, pile on the internal trauma of this character, who's just Nick Cage going ballistic, and none of the other actors in the movie can keep up with him because he's going to 10, and they're all, like, hovering at 6. <laughs> But that's yeah. all he does. He goes to 10 in all his movies. Yeah, but have you ever seen Leaving Las Vegas where he goes to 12? Yeah, that's why <laughs> yes, he won the right? Academy Award. I know, and it's an amazing movie, but it's Nick. It's the most Nick Cage movie of Nick Cage movies. It's just him going ballistic. I mean, they even my have favorite, a drink. My favorite is Vampire Kiss by, with Nicolas okay. Cage. That's a great I haven't movie. seen that in so long. I don't, I don't remember <laughs> any. I remember him running yelling he's a vampire. <laughs> I, go, before we get into the Nick Cage uh, remake more, I just want to go back to that ending. I want to let you guys know that like the studio heads actually wanted a happy ending where the rain came down on the Wicker Man and washed the fire away, and he was going to survive. And you know that just like goes to show you like how these studio heads like always want to try to play it safe, and like they could ruin the movie. And they, they would have totally went against the whole theme of the movie and the meme. You know what I mean? It, that would have been I terrible. Wonder, it was shit. It was, a stupid, it was a stupid idea that, thank God, they, they didn't do. They, they really tried to push that idea? Of course. They always try to push things like that. Okay. They always try to change the endings. How tense like was that. that scene when they had to push their heads through the, uh, the swords? Oh, I love that scene. That's probably one of my favorite scenes in the movie. Yeah. You know? I mean, I, I already told you my favorite scene in the movie. It's the Willows song is my favorite part. And then I like before that, um, which, what's the name of the song? It's like Gentle Johnny, I think is the name of the song. Yeah, it is. And they're, they're showing the slugs. I don't know why they're showing the slugs while the orgy is going on outside. I don't, but I just thought that was cool. I love how Christopher Lee's character justifies the nudity in the movie. <laughs> Where he's saying that they jump, the girls that are running around, they're jumping over the fire. It's like, well, why wouldn't they be naked? If they weren't, weren't naked, they would be getting their clothes, like, caught in the fire when they jumped over it. <laughs> I agree. I don't think any girls should wear clothes ever in case they light on fire. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> I'm running for office in 2021, by the way. <laughs> Another, I, I, I want to ask you go back real quick because you guys are yeah. saying if uh, this movie would still hold up today and like from watching it there is a lot of exposition in this movie and reason B because he has nobody to tell anybody his feelings or really show because everybody's against him so there's like no trust so any kind of exposition you get is literally him like looking down in the library and reading stuff to himself so I Sergeant Howie was looking through the books, and any kind of exposition came from his mind or his mouth. And yeah, so, but, th but that's indicative of a mystery movie. You have to have that. Well, no, the same thing with uh, Christopher Lee's character. Uh, he was when he was telling uh, Sergeant Howie yeah. about the land. Everything was explaining like the exposition. So like they hate that now in in. Hollywood. Well, I only think it was grievous at the very end of the movie when he like tells him exactly why they're sacrificing him, which as an audience member, I already knew at that point in time. That's because you probably that they had the to sacrifice him to grow the apples because they talk about human sacrifice before then. And then he does this like, you know, James Bond, um, what's that Woody Allen movie? Something in the bikini machine type thing where he has like these Charlie Angels looking girls hanging on him while he explains his evil plan. That part was a little bit off, but then they followed it up with the actual burning, which was amazing. So I'm okay with it. Okay. Uh, I think that's the only scene of the movie I think could have used work. The rest of the movie I'm, I like a lot. I did too. I loved it. I thought that it was definitely a gem of a movie. I love that, like I said, uh, we talked about it in previous episodes about those kind of slasher movies, Texas Chainsaw, Michael Myers, <laughs> and this is a different type of horror. This was more of like a psychological slow burn, get under your skin, and like the last 10 minutes is what the meaning of this whole movie is. And it, le it left me with an impression. Yeah. It left me. Do you, do you consider it a horror movie? Well, Red Room Andy, what do you, Anthony, what do you think? Red Room Anthony. 
I mean, I would hope so. This is a horror podcast. <laughs> yeah, yeah. You think it's a horror movie? I kind of consider well, it like a thriller mystery. I mean, it it does have like all these different things going on, and like it could go either way. But I mean, because it gets under your skin, and because he's completely hopeless on this land and has no one to go to and then he has no idea what the fuck is going on and then he finds out that they are pagans but still at that point you have no idea what's coming like he is he's just so out of the loop on what they're even doing so i feel like that is horror that you're stuck on this island and you have no idea what's happening because everyone is lying to you to protect whatever they're doing on this island. So that is scary. It starts to make you freak out in your head. Okay, I'll bite on that. What do you, you I, think I, so? How about you bite on this? <laughs> All right, I'll, I'll yeah. No, no, no. No, I, I think it's I think it's Would you horrible. like a banana? I, 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 I left my magnifying glass at home. What, what, I think what it's am a, I biting on? I think it's a horror. Are you done? <laughs> I think it's a horror movie because it scares me. That's why. <laughs> Oh, oh yeah. Okay. <laughs> All right. Fair enough. <laughs> uh, that's that's fair. No, dude. I'm ser- fair. I'm serious though. That, that's fair. What, what constitutes a horror movie? It's something oh, that you. that invokes fear in me while I'm watching something. So it left yeah. an impression. It scared me. It had. It didn't have any real blood or gore or monsters, yeah. and it still scared the shit out of me. Yeah. If it, I watched Chris, it in the seventies, it would have probably scared me more, having not known any of the plot before I watched. Yeah, and you're and you're like a pious, godly man. You're not like a you know these heathenist pagans like me and Anthony, right? <laughs> I, I don't like even godless, know what I don't even know what the hell that means, or like why you really enjoy the movie any less or any more. But I do want to talk about Rowan Morrison, which is actually the little girl that Miss Sergeant Howie is trying to find throughout the entire movie. And I want to okay. point out to you guys who love Midsummer or Midsummer. <laughs> and she's basically wearing the same exact thing as the girl from Midsummer. Is she? There's yeah. something. So, guys, do you guys want to talk about anything left about that stupid Wicker Man movie made with Nicolas Cage in 2006? Do you guys have any last comments about that or the? Well, I've, oh, I've said what I had to say. It's fucking absolutely ridiculous and a terrible remake. Yeah. I want to know what you guys think could have been done to make it good. Yeah, like, put what, somebody what was else wrong with the movie. <laughs> Nicholas Cage is what's wrong with the movie the most part. You think so? He's the most fucking part that's wrong. See, I think he's the best part of the movie. I think the rest of the movie is trash. He has to witness this huge crash in the beginning, like I said. His fiance is part of it. His, like, a strange child is part of it. And then they throw bees on him. Why is he th- Why is he listening to self-help tapes in the beginning of the movie? And what, like, why do they show that? Because his fiance dumped him and he feels like a loser. I she felt like... Failed. I felt like this was just like an inferior screenplay to the original movie, and it brought nothing new to the table. Like, I, it could have been cool if they yeah. showed like a third act of Nick Cage actually, actually like escaping the Wicker Man and and just turning the story on its head. And I felt like it was the same thing that we already saw. So what? Who cares? And, and well, was there was like, no thematic clash. You know, like the first one had the thematic clash of monotheism versus paganism. And what they tried to do in the remake, which was almost interesting, was do matriarchy versus patriarchy, right? Yeah, that, that but was instead it. of making Nick Cage a misogynist, he was just this really sympathetic guy whose girlfriend dumped him. Like he didn't do anything misogynistic, so there was no thematic clash. He just went there and all the guys were bitches. And he was just like, help me. And they didn't. And then he ran around in a bear suit and fucking... Uh, uh, Mike Tyson KOing people. <laughs> also, I do I do want to say something about that. That I got super angry while I was watching it on Amazon Prime the other day. The B scene is not in the theatrical release. It's only in the director's cut. In the theatrical really? release, the ending of the movie just yeah. ends. Yeah. They just throw him in the fire and he starts burning. There's like no epic. there's no epic dramatic thing like in the original. But in the director's cut, they smash his legs and they put the, you know, the famous bees on his face scene, which CGI I bees. honestly think the movie would have made that extra $2 million had they left that scene in the movie. Probably, because it definitely is hilarious. It is hilarious, yeah. I love it. Oh, no, not the bees! 
Not the beast! Ah! Out of my eyes! Fries! Ah! Ah! <laughs> I, I think the reason. cover of the remake is better than the original. The poster. <laughs> no, for yeah. I think the poster looks better, at least. Okay, that's cool. <laughs> All right, so we're going we're gonna to shift gears now. We talked about the Wicked Man. We covered the crappy one with Nicolas Cage, Wicked Man, in 2006. And now we're going to talk about the crappy movie. I mean, good movie called yeah, Midsommar. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Midsommar, Midsommar, wherever it is, directed by Ari Aster. And... So I want to I want to mention the cinematographer is Powell Pur Purgerzelski. I'm sorry if I butchered that name, but the cinematography is so wonderful in this movie. It makes anything that's good about this movie great. Okay, I want to say that the two stars of the movie we have Florence Pugh as Danny and Jack Renor as Christian, and this is a more of I, I would say a metaphorical movie. Uh, rather than a horror movie, uh, it's got a very simple story. It's about a, a guy who wants to break up with his girlfriend and her, her sister commits suicide and she clings on to him and they want to go to, uh, he wants to go on vacation with his friends and she tags along with him. And when they get to this, this place in midsummer, they experience this, this cult. And uh, you guys could take it away from there because I know you love this movie so much and uh, fill in the blanks. I love this um, movie. Anthony? I, I don't know who loves it more, me or Rob, to be honest. Yeah. But I guess we'll see. But um, as you guys know, I've said it before, people who know me well, I do not appreciate that much modern day horror because I feel like there's no, there's no, there's, there's no like great, like thoughts put into like movies these days. There's no originality um, and nothing's really executed well. But after I saw this movie, Midsommar, Midsommar, whatever it's called, I was blown away of how much I love this movie. There's so many great scenes in this film. Like, like we've talked, like for instance, we've talked in the past, I'll start with this. Me and Rob said how much we want to see more nudity in horror these days, like they used to do. And this movie is filled with nudity, like Dude, beyond delivers. belief. And Wicker it's Man amazing. has more, by the way. Just to let you know. Does it? Yes. It might. It might. It does. They, they, it has more will... nudity than the. Than but the... even if Wicker Man had a little more, it definitely didn't have the disturbing, creepy nudity scenes that were in this film. Like, yeah. it was this so fucked up to watch some of these scenes. Like also I had full frontal male nudity. By yeah. the way. Right, which was also nudity. that was a shocker. Big shocker. Do you um, think so? They have male, because they have male nudity you, in his other movies. When do you see that these days? Uh in, in Ari Arster movies. Uh okay. you know, they, but they, I mean, other than that. Uh yeah, you're right. It's um, it's in there, but it's not common. Like Chris, yeah. you say this wasn't really a horror movie. I have to completely disagree with you because this movie got severely under my skin throughout the whole film because yeah. it's, it's just so uncomfortable to see, like, every scene, you're just like, what the fuck is happening? Why is this happening? Like, it's just got weirder and more fucked up as the film was going on. And especially, like, the scene... Like when the people are committing suicide, it's just like I did not expect that. I thought the guy was standing up there; he was going to make some like cult speech. And the next thing you know, smash on the rock, his fucking face is just decimated, and uh, and just like it's just it was even creepier because like no one's reacting except for like that one dude. He's like wanting to throw up, and like all the other characters are just like standing there like in shock. Anthony, I just, can I take like, this one? Because this is like, this is like what I was saying last week. The problem with the remake of Texas Chainsaw and that scene in the beginning we were talking about, Chris, where the girl shoots herself in the mouth and dies, and they display the shock, the shocking effect, that like aura of like being underwater, being drowned out, and then everyone runs out and then they start freaking out. See, this movie did it separately, differently in the correct way. See, um. Because it's actually the woman who jumps first and she smashes her head on the rock and it's just like silence and we're stuck looking at that and we're like, oh my God. 
and then we start getting this drowning out effect of shock. See, it lets it resonate with us first before we see what happens to the characters even, and we get their feeling of shock. We, we get to be affected by that disgusting scene. And then afterwards when they take <laughs> the, the, ha- the sledgehammer, <laughs> smash the face, and that's incredible. Wasn't it great? And they take turns smashing the head. Oh, oh my God. Man. I agree with both of you guys that that scene is very shocking. And they do, in the horror aspect of it, they did it right. And it's crazy because I think that scene doesn't even happen until about like 58, 59 minutes into the film. So before that, there is no violence. There's a, what are you there's talking a couple about? Of slids. There's no violence. The girl commits suicide. What about the girl? About it. She, that, but yeah, but that scene is so no messed violence, up. But there's no physical violence up until that point. Of like well, anything I mean, hitting another thing. What yeah, there's, there's no like visceral violence, but they we get to see two parents murdered and her have <laughs> like the, the gas hose duct taped to her face all Darth Vader style. Right. But what I'm, yeah, saying, but like, what I'm but saying is like, not... Go ahead. No, go ahead. I, all I'm going to say to this point is, is this. If you were on an island or you were, or you were, on, you were anywhere and you saw that, wouldn't you run as fast as you can and get out of there? And it just made no sense for the characters to logically just Christian and Danny to like witness this. They never witnessed this before and just say, Oh, that's what the tribe does. Let's just stay and we'll wait for dinner. They didn't run. They didn't like react in any kind of way. And that kind of killed it for me. And listen, I love Ari Asta. I think he is the king of horror. I can't wait to see more of his movies. He makes solid, solid horror. All right? But in Hereditary, there was a major plot hole, too. That was, by the way, for you fans, if you don't know, Heroes also directed Hereditary. In Hereditary, yeah. he kills the, the, his, uh, the, the kid kills his uh, sister by accident. Her head gets cut off in the car. And uh, the mother finds out. And prior to that scene, why, oh, why would a mother encourage a kid to take his 12-year-old sister to an 18-year-old party? It well, makes no I don't sense. think she was then, 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 All right, she's 13, 14. <laughs> she's like 14, right? It still doesn't make any sense. And well, it's so, a high school party. Uh, I, don't, I disagree. Dude, I don't know. My, I, parents, another, my mom used to, my brother. Another so thing about him. it was that after, like, they died, they didn't show anything with the cops. It was just like, bing, bang, she's dead, funeral. Okay, let's talk about the drama in the house. There was no repercussions at all with the cops. So going back to that plot hole, that kind of killed it for me, that movie. And then Midsommar, it, this was like a jarring, gaping plot hole in front of my face that kind of killed it for me from that point forward. I enjoyed it as far as, like, the shock value and the tension. And I love the cinematography because the, product, the, uh, the set design actually told the story through foreshadowing, which you guys should get into more, too. That yeah, was but excellent. I want to disagree with you on the character's interaction with that because Josh, the character, the other anthropologist, he knew what was going to happen. He just didn't tell them. Which is even more bullshit and like, oh, no, they're going to... it's not. The idea, he was trying to write a dissertation on societies that do things like this. He wanted it to be more extreme for his paper. He was kind of looking at them as if they were almost like circus animals. He was mistreating these people in this traditional society that way. And then, you know, um, also like Flor- uh, Danny, she wanted to run away too, right? But where was she going to run? It took him four and a half hours to get there from the nearest town. She would have just run into the woods. The other, couple go, left, the other couple left. The other couple, I forgot their name. They tried to leave. Remember, she wanted to leave, and her boyfriend talked her out of it. Because he was writing a dissertation, too. Like, yeah. Chris, like, I understand what you're saying. Like, yeah. you know, if you're in your right state of mind, you would want to run because you're like, all right, this is like crazy, sadistic, whatever the fuck this is. But, like, the characters, like when they were staying there, they were writing. weren't they doing like a paper? On Not this? Danny and like yeah. the, the boyfriend. Still, it was like jarring. It's just that any human that like never witnessed that before, without like any kind of warning, wouldn't act like that. It felt like wet, like a lot of plot convenience to me. From that point, how, how do you think they would have reacted? Because get the fuck out of there. there. Get Where out. Would, they couldn't go anywhere. Where would they have gone? I they don't would have to ask the people they're staying with to take them out of there. 
I don't know. You know what? Another thing that didn't make sense, and you could go look at at the movie when yeah. um, what's his name? When the boyfriend is looking at his cell phone, and it's like a day and a half of no charging. There's full battery on the cell phone in the top right corner. I got to be top full cell phone service if his, his phone was dead. Makes no sense. I don't know. I, I know I it's a little that thing. Hard. I know I it's a little I, thing. I don't know. Maybe. Maybe. Um, but I mean, that, that but, sounds. Uh, all right. Well, listen. Um, it's really hard to come across a movie that's going to be 100% perfect. Obviously, there's going to be some little things that don't make sense or whatever, or people disagree with. But I feel like after the suicide scene, the movie got so fucked up and so entertaining. Like, it, it was a slow burn into really fucked up. Like, how about the part when that girl took, uh, what, what, I forget his name, um, from the table when they were eating. She was like, oh, come with me. I'll show you. And they're like, oh, it was where are you Mark. going? Yeah, he was like, he was like, oh, she's gonna show me, and I'm just like, what? And then the next day or whatever, I forget their names, but he walked down and, and then he went to that other building, and yeah. then they hit him with the hammer or whatever, and it's his fucking face on somebody else. It was like Dude, a leather that's face. That's the worst part of the movie. movie. But that shit that's was like so the that's the worst part of the movie. Like that was so incongruent with everything else. Like it was. But it cool so creepy. I'll tell you what, so it did. How about the guy pissing on the tree in front of everybody, which is like ridiculous when you're around all this forest land. Go in the fucking forest and pee. <laughs> Why would you pee on the sacred tree? It's a total well, pothole. I mean, pothole. I get it, but he it's like know. okay. Why the would tree's you do like that? closer than the forest. Time. The tree's closer than the forest. It's obstructing his wiener when he's peeing. No. So he just thought it was okay. Yeah, he's an idiot. It's plot convenience. That's what I'm trying well, to Well, I'll tell you what. The first time I saw the movie, I remember being angry at the characters. On a second watch, I wasn't angry with the characters at all. I, I felt like all their decisions were motivated. Mark's character was just kind of a little too dumb. Well, what? ask yourself this. Why would he even go to this island... To, I thought he wanted to pick up chicks. He's going to pick up chicks while they're like, you know, they're doing all these sacrificial kind of things <laughs> in this cult. It, it didn't make any sense. He was just going with his friends, man. And, and another thing, too. What about the sister, right? The sister commits suicide in the beginning of the movie. What yeah. else? It never comes back ever into the plot. All it is is the catalyst to, like, make her, like, go with the friends. Dude, what are you talking about? That's the whole problem with the thought. It's, um... The guy, uh, what's his name, Pell? Pell, okay. the whole time, wants her to be there because he was an orphan, too, and he knows that they're really family. And the movie's about her trying to replace the family she's lost with a new family. And, and also, that, he wanted her. <laughs> but what does yeah, that have was, to do with the suicide? He didn't control the suicide. There's actually a fan theory that he did control the suicide, which I don't agree with at all, but there is a fan theory that he orchestrated the entire suicide, and it was actually a triple murder, not a double murder suicide, orchestrated by the cult in order to get Danny, who had the birthday at the beginning of the May Festival, um, looked a lot like those people too, because you know they're particular about their genetics, and uh, he was in love with her. So he did all that in order to get her there. Now I think that's false. I don't think that's the case, because that's a little ridiculous, but it's, it's a fun fan theory. I heard another fan theory that her parents that are dead in the beginning of the movie, you see them at the very end while the, uh, the house is burning down, while the triangle is burning down. You see them in the crowd with her. The father and the mother. Yeah. And, um, uh, oh, that right. makes sense. There's another well, thing, That's too. like a metaphor. There's another thing, too. When they're holding Danny up after she won the, uh, the dance, the dance off. Yeah. And then they're walking past the trees. You could actually see the sister in the trees huffing on the exhaust pipe. No. Which is crazy. Yeah. They have, That's all, awesome. yeah, they have all this crazy like symbolism and like deep meaning. Like, uh, of course, like you could see like the way all the people when they're sitting, that, uh, that aerial shot of how the table yeah. set up, it set up like one of the, um, the symbols. Oh, right, yeah, I did notice that. But there's all, what I'm saying is, like, everywhere in the movie, there's, like, hit, little hidden Easter eggs, which is, that I love about the movie. I love that they show, you know, the camera pans across, and it shows, like, the, um, it shows, like, the foreshadowing of what's going to happen. It shows the pubic hair that's going to go into the, uh, the pie, and then it's going to go into so the drink. Another <laughs> thing, really quick, big plot hole. 
right? Christian, out of 100 people, they all have lemonade. His lemonade is pink lemonade. I'm not going to get in why, but you can kind of <laughs> arrive to why, why it's, it's dark in lemonade. He doesn't notice it. I, I don't understand how none of the characters notice that he, there's something off with his drink. No, the, well, yeah. actually, no, his, his girlfriend did. If you see her in the if you see her in the scene, she's staring at the lemonade and then looks up at him like, "Don't you realize this?" Okay, but she but doesn't then, say anything. But that's, that's like cool. another thing decision like that. I guess Ari Asta did on purpose. But the characters are like so stupid in that way where they they like. I, I remember there's a question like uh, Danny, like she looks at the lemonade. She's like, "Oh, what's this made out of?" And she just the girl doesn't answer. And she's like, oh, okay. They only ask questions like one time. If they don't get the answer, they just keep moving on with their lives. So there's no real like questioning like what is going on here. It's just like the characters, which is kind of unrealistic, but it's good for the movie. It's no, just- I don't think it's unrealistic though, because they're at the mercy of this place uh, they're in. Like in, in, the, in the first one, right? Like there's more of an ideological the first clash. One, this is yeah, I mean, in Wicker Man. In oh. Wicker Man, there's more of an ideological clash than there is in Midsummer. In Midsummer, they come as adver- ad- observers watching a kind of like circus event, and they think they're watching the animals when really they're the animals about to be slaughtered, right? But in The Wicker Man, he comes in already despising these people because he hates paganism. He thinks it's morally corrupt. So he's more willing, you know, uh, Sergeant Howie, to argue with people and to say he's not going to do things and fight and stuff, then these other guys who are there to try and experience it, right? Especially Danny, who ends up, you know, being kind of adopted by this family. But did, all right, I'll ask you guys another question since you guys love this movie so much. Didn't you feel <laughs> like there was like a lack of substance of what these people were about, why they were doing what they were doing? And it was just like, oh, by the way, you guys are on this island and we're going to sacrifice your boyfriend. I, I know, like, underneath it all, what this whole movie really was about was, like, falling out of love. And it, it was really about, like, having a bad relationship with another person. And there's tons of symbolism to prove that and back it up. It, it's supposed there to be is. about Danny, who's, like, she, she actually, she in the beginning of the movie, she resents Christian because she calls him on the phone and she says, oh, my sister's not picking up. And he's like, oh... She's whatever. And she always does this. And she goes, what do you mean? She's bipolar. He's like, ah, oh, it'll be all right. So she doesn't act because she listens to her boyfriend. She ends up killing the sister, ends up killing the parents, and then herself. So at first, she resents him. He doesn't want her to be on the, on the trip with them. But she goes anyway because she's so codependent on his love. And she's afraid she's going to lose him. And the whole movie is about, like, you know, even even with the cinematography, the beginning of the movie when they show Danny, the first scene, she's in this very dark room, and then like towards the end of the movie, the, like the last shots, it's vibrant, bright. She goes, she has a character arc. She's like super depressed, and the the last shot of her is is her smiling. So it's right. actually, she, the costumes of everyone they they add more colors they per do. feast, so yeah. first day of it. So the beginning, it's almost completely white, and then I believe they added a little bit of red. Because and they started adding some blue and stuff. But by the way, the costume design, we I think we all have to agree. The it's costume amazing. design and the set design and all the set pieces are fantastic. Dude, it's, really yeah, it's It's a beautiful. A plus. Yeah. Yeah. And a most plus. of the movie, all right, it, it's not like The Revenant, where which I hate that movie, by the way. But it's not like The Revenant where they claim the whole thing is natural light. A lot of this movie is natural light. By the way, The Revenant was not all natural light. And if you color correct every frame of the movie, you're not using natural light. Shut up. But that aside. Right. No, I agree. You're right. 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 Yeah, yeah. Yeah. So I do. Like, we're grips. We know, like, if you just torture the crew, it doesn't mean your movie's great. Like, whatever. But in this one, they actually tried to bring in a lot more control into the area. But they were having problems. If you notice, there's all these giant sweeping shots. Well, they couldn't get all the trucks on the field to hold up these giant fly swatters, which for anyone who doesn't know, they're like giant frames you put up to manipulate sun and other kinds of lights. Diffuse and they also light, couldn't even, soften it. Yeah, they also couldn't even use a lot of the lights they wanted to to compete with the sun just because the sun was so bright and they were shooting, you know, at it was the daylight sun. Dependent, right? It's right there. Yeah. So they had to do shorter days and they had to rush and for the most part just use smaller equipment, which is still 20 by 20 frames. And they did say they had a, a craned 18K, which 
Wow. You guys don't know, that's a huge light. A yeah. We use it a lot, but um, they use that for most of the close-ups and stuff. But in general, comparatively to other movies of this budget, there was very little light being added. It was mostly natural light, and it was all about controlling that natural light with very minimal needs. Like a lot of bounces from the ground right. that go up. Like you know, hitting on. white pieces of uh, material to bounce the sun up at the actors or something. Yeah, no, no, dude. One of the last scenes, you could actually see the dolly track left in the shot. It's a wide oh, no, shot. Really? Yeah, you do. You see it on the left. It's like that. It's dolly. It's yeah. like that clip in uh, Gladiator where you see the the hazer or something during the chariot scene. What do you think they use? A lot of bleach muslin to bounce it, or like what? What, what do they uh, use? Dude, I don't know. I mean, it's hard to tell. Um, they shot that movie on a Panavision camera. It was the DXL2S uh, Millennium, and they used uh, artiste lenses in, like, large format. But they were detuned to kind of lift the blacks a little bit because um, a lot of what he was trying to do, the cinematographer whose name I can't say, well, I'm just going to edit in his name pop-up. Um, Grozelski. Yeah, yeah. A lot of what he was trying to do was shoot as close to overexposure as possible so that um, – and he did a lot of testing to see what would make things clip a little bit because you got to remember he's shooting bright sun on white clothing. And if anyone's ever tried to shoot anything on a camera, you know that that's like a no, no from the beginning. You don't shoot black in a dark place and you don't shoot white in a light place. And he did both. Yeah, You could yeah. definitely tell in the film that it was not easy to do this, this movie. No. To get shots like the way they did. Definitely not. Yeah, definitely. Hey, and you were, uh, to go back to what you were saying, Chris, we're going to backtrack a little bit here. When you said that they uh, foreshadowed a lot of the movie, if you go back and watch Hereditary, they do a very similar thing with the dollhouse in that film. No, I agree with what you're saying. They, uh, they have similar shots from that movie that carried over to this one. Like when the camera goes upside down. It's almost How cool is that? It was cool. It was cool. Um, I thought it was a little overused in Midsommar. I thought it was better used in Hereditary, though. Because okay, it was just like, it was kind of like like in your face, like, all right, we're going to show this, the, the car is going upside down. Like, obviously, it's showing that we're going into a dark place here, even though it's sunny. And See, I like that scene, that shot so much. I feel like it built so much tension. The tension building from the beginning when her sister dies and, like, the fire department shows up to her crying on her boyfriend's lap. Man, she cries to... all through the friggin' movie. She cries more than um, the, that movie Black Swan. <laughs> Is there a lot of crying Natalie, in Black Swan? With, yeah, Natalie Portman. She cries almost 75% of the movie. And Danny in this movie is like always crying. So, oh, okay, no, every, all right. Shot. All right, I'm sorry. Yeah, go back. I, I know you didn't like it, but I got a question for you, Chris. <laughs> and yeah, you, go ahead. What, what is your favorite scene of the movie? I don't know. Go, Anthony. I gotta think about it. <laughs> <laughs> Anthony, uh, after after we do our favorite scenes, I want to do favorite kill. Probably my fa my favorite scene is is definitely the ending, and like because it's so. I, oh, when the guy. Uh, uh, sorry, spoiler alert. When the guy is sitting in the in the triangle, and they they go open your mouth and they put the drug in his mouth, thinking and he thinks that it's gonna help him numb yeah. him from the pain. And then he catches on fire and he starts screaming, screaming in agony <laughs> because it didn't. And, and that was like shocking. And that the friends are stuffed with hay and put it, the, the guys that are dead are stuffed. Their bodies are like drawn out, uh, sucked yeah. out and just stuffed with hay and put in this fucking, I don't know, this triangle. That's awesome. Um, no, I mean, I think I have to agree with Chris. With a uh, favorite scene. I mean, there is so many awesome scenes that I love in this movie. But, yeah, the ending was definitely um, horrifying. The fact that it was just their face and then they were made into, like, scarecrows. That's fucking – that's so sadistic. It like, is. And then how the guy's burning like that. I thought that was – I actually laughed when it happened. Not Me that too. it was funny. I laughed because – it's just like your friend just gave you this pill and it did nothing <laughs> for you at all, and now you're just burning alive. Can it I say really something? Was what, what'd you think of the people screaming outside while he was burning? 
Oh, I thought how crazy, I thought we were was, dancing all weird. Oh and, yeah, what did it remind you of? What what other movie was like that similar? <laughs> oh, we kind of discussed it about a half hour ago. No? Yeah, yeah. But the difference was they were happy in that one. In this one, they were empathizing with his pain by screaming in tune with the guy screaming who was on fire. That is because, because all right. I'll give you that. Yeah. Okay, because I'll give you well, that. I'll I'll tell you because this this goes in with it. My favorite scenes were, I mean, one of my favorite scenes was when she starts crying after she looked through the keyhole and she has like a panic attack of pulled out. I was meltdown. just about to say that, Rob. I love that, that part. With the and all the girls cover around her, and they actually they start like crying and moaning in sync with her because they actually like empathize with her. Unlike Christian, who when she cried on his lap, he's like, I don't want to be here. But when she's with her real family at the end of the movie and she's crying, they want to be there with her. They want to feel what she felt. Just like the people who were watching, they actually intercut this. I call it the sequence of moans. When <laughs> Christian's banging the... She's actually... You know what's crazy? That girl in the movie is supposed to be like 14. Yeah. I, I know the actress is like in her oh, 20s, but the girl in the movie is supposed to be 14. She just hit her womanhood. The look she that she... In the, uh, in the lemonade. I've never seen those two scenes. I've never seen anything like that ever in my whole life in a movie. I was in shock. I was like, what is happening? I was like, this is the weirdest, craziest shit I've ever and seen. And the old ladies cheering, her, cheering him on as he's doing it. Oh, my God. Yeah. It's and then so going behind him. Disturbing. It's, just a, it's just a weird, disturbing scene. It's so it extremely disturbing. I wanted to mention real quick about the last scene. It's actually, like I, we were saying, that this movie has a lot of foreshadowing in it. So if you go back to the first scene and you see uh, Danny's house, in her room, there's this picture where this little girl with, like, a crown of flowers is petting a bear. So just so you know, like, check that it out. It's pretty cool. Another that good awesome. thing about the symbolism of their relationship is the women actually dancing around in circles because it represents Danny and Christian's relationship that they're both not happy and they just keep going around in circles with no like resolution to their relationship. So he really hit home. Ari Asta really went nuts with the symbolisms and the metaphors in this movie. But yeah. because he did, does that necessarily make this a great movie? And in my opinion, I don't think that's why it's a great movie. Okay. I think I think, I think, movie, I think me and Rob really want to know why Chris fucking hates this I'll movie. I'll tell you why. I'll tell you why. Because when the advertisement came on this movie, I wanted to see it so bad. And every night I had to work as a grip and I couldn't see this movie. And I tried to pirate it every single night and I couldn't find it all over the internet. And then when <laughs> I finally found it, I put it on and watched it. And I, my expectations was this movie could have been the godfather of horror movies. If you call The Wicker Man the Citizen Kane of horror movies, this was the motherfucking godfather. And it blew <laughs> it. And I felt like when I was left in this movie, there were a couple of great scenes, but overall it was very pretentious. I said my piece. <laughs> wow. Well, I, dude, I, I couldn't, I couldn't disagree more. I think you're wrong. Yeah, I know. <laughs> I, I, I draw, I, I, I draw into question your whole ability to critique films now. Okay. Yeah, yeah. Why? But that's how, that's how off you are. Because this movie's great and it's scary. How awesome was the Blood Eagle scene? What's scary about the movie? The Blood Eagle scene. That's terrifying. The what? The Blood Eagle scene when he walks in and he sees the other guy. I'm not even oh, with the, with the flowers in his eyes? He the, he's still alive, by the way. He has the flowers in his eyes. They opened up his back and they pulled his lungs out of his back, which they actually did used to do in, Viking, in uh, like Viking times. They used to, it's called the blood eagle, and they would splay your back open and pull your organs out. Basically, Wait, inside you? out the person. And anthropologists are still not sure if, that was, if they were capable of keeping people alive doing that, because obviously I they can't test it. But how? Well, you, you got to see, like, you can cut someone's back open and they're still alive for a while, right? Like no, surgery? No, I'm saying, if you well, take their lungs they, out, how can you be alive? You need to breathe. Because they're still connected. They just take them out of your back, but they're still connected via whatever tubes connect the airway. So you can still oh, technically breathe. Time. Yeah, so with medical science, it would be possible to, like, open up your lungs and have them, like, up, up like that, right? And you can breathe. 
and stay alive. But the, the idea is like, could they do that with the primitive technology? And then as we learn more about history, we realize that they're able to do brain surgeries and cure so many things with this primitive technology or quote unquote primitive technology that it begs the question that possibly they were able to do this horrific thing and keep you alive for days on end with your organs on the inside out, that's, which is that's, disgusting. That's really nice, but I'll, I'll put this movie <laughs> the discredit right now. Anthony, I'll ask you a question, simple question. What was the sacrifice about? Why? Why did they do a sacrifice? And what was it about? To what God, to what? Go. Wait, say that again? Why did they do the sacrifice at the very end of the film? Besides just making it plot convenience to show that, like, Danny needed a character change and to burn the to burn her boyfriend. To show, like, they, they took the two stories and they intertwined them to make it one story at the end. But it was definitely forced. So I don't know why they really sacrificed these eight or nine people in that triangle. Why did they sacrifice them? I mean... You don't to, know. Be honest with you, to be honest with you, Chris, I mean, I know it's a part of, like, the pagan religion. Like, Big fucking deal. But no, 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 no. I'm just saying, like, I don't really know the deep core on why that is actually happening in the religion. Right, because yeah. the answer is they had no answer. It was just... They did. They the answered plot. in the movie. It was the end of the 90-year cycle. They do it every 90 years. Oh, and it's, it's, on, not, it's not verbatim come lifted come from Viking on. culture. Dude, the Vikings used to sacrifice people a lot. Have you ever seen the show Vikings? They sacrifice people. Historically, yeah, we that should happened. we should we should only be grateful we didn't live in the Viking era because we would have been yeah. short. <laughs> yeah, we would have. Because I'm pretty short, I probably wouldn't have been pillaging much. Those were the most badass people on the face of the earth. Yeah, they were also like eight feet or six feet tall when everyone else. Was they like, made they, like, yeah, they made they made pi- they made pirates look like Teletubbies. They were <laughs> pirates. They were like the, the original. Badass pirates in our big um, long they were like They were like pirates on steroids. <laughs> yeah, they were running around like killing Christians and giving them blood eagles and stuff. Yeah. Just ripping them inside out. You know, you know what's another good movie where they rip something inside out? We should watch this later. You ever see Society? Yes. Oh, uh, yeah. Is. I love that. Yeah, movie. yeah, When he gives them the rip out at the end. I just want to mention that. It's not like this movie at it's all. It's a good movie. We definitely Great reviewed film. that movie on a future podcast because I love it. Yeah, but, yeah. I think we should do like an '80s ultra ultra violence. We can do that in Toxic okay. Avenger. Yeah. yeah. So yeah. to to wrap this podcast up, I'm gonna ask you guys the uh, 100 million dollar question that I asked at the beginning <laughs> of the show. What was a better movie, The Wicker Man or The Wicker Man 1973 or Midsummer? Okay, I'll go first. Go ahead. Um. I do agree. There's definitely a lot of similarities between the movies. Um, but I definitely feel like Midsommar definitely did their own thing also. Um, this is going to shock everyone that knows me as a horror fan. Because I would it's never... It's an eight-page one, right? I That's would your never, favorite? <laughs> <laughs> That's it. I would never pick a modern-day film over a classic uh, but midsummer actually blew me away and i loved it so much i want to watch it again so badly so uh, i'm going with midsummer rob that's two for midsummer man i love midsummer man i love it and i, I got i got a shout out when he finds the foot in the field that's, that's awesome cool. oh that's right. awesome <laughs> There's this whole thing about going back to nature. So in this movie, they literally put people back in nature by covering them in flowers and burying them in the ground. They turn them like into you see, Like you see, like, look how many scenes we're thinking of that caught our attention. Like, when you think of The Wicker Man, you can't think of that many scenes that were blowing you away. I, I do, actually, right now. What about the mother who's breastfeeding the child in the middle of the cemetery? That is weird. And, and, and oh, I just... I was going to forget this before we went off the air. I'm glad I mentioned this. I, so in The Wicker Man, by the way, The Wicker Man's the better movie. In The Wicker Man. <laughs> the, in the, the Wicker Age of the 73. The 73. <laughs> Nick Cage can take a hike. Oh, I would love to work with Nick Cage one day. We would love, we would love people to comment on this podcast to see who. Please, who I, want want you guys to, I want you guys to comment. I want you guys to tell me what you think. If what you haven't think? seen Midsommar, see it now. Wait a minute. Yes. Before I forgot my, my thought, 
there was a lot of uh, nods in, in the Wicker Man, the original one, to a hare or a bunny, a rabbit. So he opens up, there's the chocolate bunnies, he opens up the, um, <clears throat> the crypt, I mean, sorry, the coffin, and there's a rabbit in there. I was wondering if Midsommar ripped off or gave a nod to the Wicker Man in the scene when he's drinking the lemonade and it's pubic hair. Do you think that's, hair has to do with the other one? Yeah, that's like the dumbest okay. thing I've ever heard, Chris. I mean... <laughs> that is so on. dumb. Dude, dude not, even the rap, there's a lot of nods to the Wicker Man in this movie because it's a similar plot. And the bear? But, what about the bear? The bear is a nod to yeah, the cage. Yeah, but a rabbit's a general sign of fertility. Like, you ever heard of Easter? Like, come on, man. That goes way back so much further than the Wicker Man. That's not a nod. Yeah, and, and also, also Easter is the most uh, uh, Catholic religious holiday. Yes, but it's also adopted from the pagan holidays of fertility. That's why well, they're yeah. rabbits. Yeah, and they only just kind of, like, shoehorned Jesus in there. Yeah. Who, by the way... If we've learned anything from this podcast, it's that if you're in a wicker man being lit on fire, Jesus is not going to save you. <laughs> Tosh. That's, that struck a chord. Okay, I, I, got a, I got a question for you guys. Yeah. Was Midsummer a ripoff of the wicker man? In, in a sense, um, it was. But at the same time, it the director went his own way and did create a different type of storyline if that makes any sense. It's like a yes and no situation. It's not a full yes to me. It was a ripoff of The Wicked Man for the right reasons. And the, why I say that is because where the Nick Cage uh, movie went wrong because it didn't go into a different direction, which was like a direct uh, reboot of The Wicked Man, this movie took elements of The Wicked Man so they kind of gave people like me or other people who've seen The Wicked Man expectations that oh okay this is where they're going with the story and then they took it a different direction which was cool so like they kind of used the wicker man nods in their favor to kind of throw off the audience what what i didn't like is like what i said is it was like a three hour very simple pretentious story with some good scares but a lot of plot holes See, I didn't. I don't think it was that simple of a story. And I'm also just going to straight up say it's not a ripoff of The Wicker Man, and that critics don't give horror movies credit for using similar plots. They consider them all ripoffs. When if you watch any rom com, there's about nine thousand of them that are exactly the same. They get much higher ratings. I don't think having a movie about a human sacrifice where someone gets lit on fire is necessarily a ripoff. And I do agree with you that he changed enough elements. To, to justify its existence, but I also think he, enough elements are, comp- are so different, including the thematic relevance, the character's motivations, and the, even the setting, to say that it is not a ripoff. It simply yeah, like, pays homage in certain scenes. I think thir- only 30% of Midsommar is a ripoff. I think 70% is all like the director is coming up with new shit. Yeah, I think that's even a high number. I would go, I would say it's much less. I'll, and, I'll, uh, go. I, no, I'll leave you guys with this. Even though that I think that Wicker Man uh, beats Midsommar, I cannot say enough what Ari Asta has done with two movies to the, uh, the horror genre. I love that horror drama kind of movie that he's brought to the table. I love the cinematography, the cinematography he has with him. And I just love his style. Um, it's very scary. And I, I do, besides me saying all this stuff about Midsommar because I was disappointed with it, I do expect a lot great, more movies that are going to be awesome in the coming years. I think, he has a, I think he has a promising career ahead of him. Uh, he's the king already. He's, he's probably number one horror director right now. Yeah, yeah def- I think so. Yeah, so. Anyway. Yeah. All right. So uh, that wraps up our episode, guys. So please, when uh, we get off the air, like, subscribe, comment, tell us what you think. Next week, we're going to be doing the Hellraiser franchise, which I am so stoked for. I love So excited for that. How many movies do you got to watch, Rob? 
Oh my god, I've watched three so far, so I have another seven to go through. And apparently there's a bunch of short films, too, I intend on watching. You're gonna watch them all. They have such uh, shot sights to show you. Dude, I don't know if I can watch nine. Nine is so bad. I watched part of it the other day. Oh, man. I'm gonna watch it. Anyway, thank you guys. Thank you, everybody. And uh, we'll see you next week. Smell you later. <laughs>